good morning again, First Baptist Duxbury. We're going to step away from the Psalms this week because it's Reformation Sunday. We're going to be celebrating Reformation Sunday. There are many Christians that I have talked to in my time who don't know what Reformation is. They heard little things about it, or they know little things, but they don't really understand what Reformation Sunday is. Reformation Sunday is a Protestant religious holiday celebrated on October 31st. It recognizes the day the German monk Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg Church in 1517. And this morning, I'm going to go over three of those 95 thesis of, of what, is, what it was. This act is to, com to com commemorate as the official starting point of the Protestant Revolution, um, Reformation. What you need to understand is up until this point, there was Judaism, or the nation of Israel, and Catholicism. Everything else, everything else was pagan worship or other religions, but they were not Christ-centered. So that is why this is an important thing to understand. Within the Lutheran tradition, Reformation Day is considered a lesser holiday and is officially named the Festival of the, Revela of the Reformation. Most Lutheran churches and others who celebrate this day commemorated on the Sunday prior to the 31st. And as we all know, tomorrow is the 31st. So I have asked Susan to come up and to read and give you the Reader's Digest version of who Martin Luther is, who he is, who he was. Sister, come on up and read, please. This Reader's Digest version of a quick history of Martin Luther was taken from a number of sources. Here I Stand, A Life of Martin Luther by Richard Bainton, Martin Luther, A Short Biography by Thomas Martin Lindsay, as well as the following websites, www.biography.com and www.christianitytoday.com. Martin Luther was born on November 10th, 1483 in Eisleben, Saxony, in modern Southeast Germany. His father, Hans, and his mother, Margaret Luther, were, were of peasants. In 1484, Hans moved his family to nearby Mansfield, where he had some success mining ore. Mining was a tough business, and Martin's father, Hans, wanted more for his son. He wanted Martin to become a lawyer. At age seven, Martin went to school in Mansfield. At age 14, Martin went north to Magdeburg, where he continued to study. In 1498, he returned to Eisleben to enroll in a school studying grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Martin hated school. In 1501, Martin Luther entered the University of Erfurt, where he received a Master of Arts degree in grammar, logic, rhetoric, and metaphysics. At this time, it seemed he was on his way to becoming a lawyer. However, in July 1505, Luther had a life-changing experience that set him on a new course. Caught in a horrific thunderstorm where he feared for his life, Martin Luther cried out to St. Anne, the patron saint of minors, save me, St. Anne, and I'll become a monk. The storm subsided and he was saved. Most historians believe this was not a spontaneous act but an idea already formulated in Martin's mind. 
The decision to become a monk was difficult and greatly disappointed his father, but he felt he must keep a promise. Luther was also driven by fears of hell and God's wrath, and he felt that life in a monastery would help him find salvation. The first few years of monastery life were difficult for Martin Luther as he did not find the religious enlightenment he was seeking. A mentor told him to focus his life exclusively on Christ, and this would later provide him with the guidance he sought. At age 27, he was given the opportunity to be a delegate to a church conference in Rome. He came away more disillusioned, very discouraged, by the immorality and corruption he witnessed there among the Catholic priests. Upon his return to Germany, he enrolled in the University of Wittenberg in an attempt to suppress his spiritual turmoil. He excelled in his studies and received a doctorate, becoming a professor of theology at the university. Through his studies of scripture, Martin Luther finally gained religious enlightenment. Beginning in 1513 while preparing lectures, Luther read the first line of Psalm 22, which Jesus cried, wailed in his cry for mercy on the cross, a cry similar to Luther's own disillusionment with God and religion. Two years later, while preparing a lecture on Paul's epistle to the Romans, he read, the just shall live by faith. He dwelled on this statement for some time. Finally, he realized the key to spiritual salvation was not fear to fear God or to be enslaved by religious dogma, but to believe that faith alone would bring salvation. This period marked a major change in his life and set in motion the Reformation. In 1517, Pope Leo X announced a new round of indulgences to build St. Peter's Basilica. On October the 31st, 1517, an angry Martin Luther nailed a sheet of paper with 95 theses on the university's Wittenberg Chapel door. Though he intended these to be discussion points, the 95 Theses laid out a devastating critique of indulgences as corrupting people's faith. Luther also sent a copy to Archbishop Albert Albrecht of Mainz, calling on him to end the sale of indulgences. Aided by the printing press, copies of the 95 Theses spread throughout Germany within two weeks and throughout Europe within two months. The church eventually moved to stop, stop this act of defiance on Martin's part. In October 1518, at the meeting with Cardinal Toms Kajetan in Augsburg, Martin Luther was ordered to recant his 95 theses by the authority of the Pope. Luther said he would not recant unless scripture proved him wrong. He went further, stating that he didn't consider the papacy had the authority to interpret scripture. The meeting ended in a shouting match and initiated his ultimate excommunication from the church. Throughout 1519, Martin Luther continued to lecture and write in Wittenberg. In June and July of that year, he publicly declared that the Bible did not give the Pope the exclusive right to interpret scripture, which was a direct attack on the authority of the papacy. Finally, in 1520, the Pope had had enough and on June 15th issued an ultimatum, threatening Luther with excommunication. On December the 10th, 1520, Luther publicly burned the letter. In January 1521, Martin Luther was officially excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. In March, he was summoned before the Diet of Worms, a general assembly of secular authorities. 
Again, Luther refused to recant his statements, demanding to be shown by any scripture that would refute his position. There was none. On May 8, 1521, the council released the Edict of Worms, banning Luther's writings and declaring him a convicted heretic. This made him a condemned and wanted man. Friends helped him hide out in Wartburg Castle. While in seclusion, he translated the New Testament into the German language to give ordinary people the opportunity to read God's word. In 1525, he married Katharina von Bora, a former nun who had abandoned the convent and taken refuge in Wittenberg. Together, over the next several years, they had six children. From 1513 to his death in 1546, Martin Luther served as the Dean of Theology at University of Wittenberg. During this time, he suffered from many illnesses, arthritis, heart problems, digestive orders, and depression. So that's who Martin Luther was. The impact of Martin Luther in the Protestant Reformation has been enormous on a global level in Christianity. Think about it like this. That's where every other religion came out of as far as Christian faith. This is where Baptists started. This is where the Lutheran Church started. This is where the, um, the Christian faith took off because Luther had the audacity to use the word of God against the Catholic Church. And that is the result. So that's why we celebrate it. The main verse from Luther is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. One of the other things that I, I want to explain to you before I get into the text that we're going to be um, really preaching out of, which is Romans chapter 3, verses 19 to 28. Many of us who did not grow up Catholic, and I am one of those who never grew up Catholic, I have been to Catholic Mass, um, I, have, I have obviously have a, very, a large amount of friends who are Catholic, and I've asked questions, I've talked to priests, I've, I've really researched because I was interested in the Catholic religion as would it pertain to, um, we didn't know what an indulgence was. What is, what is that? And let me just briefly tell you what it was, okay? In the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, an indulgence, indulgence is a way to reduce the amount of punishment one has to undergo for sins. It may reduce either the penance required after a sin has been forgiven or the temporal punishment after death in the state of process of purification called purgatory. The recipient of the, indulgence, of the indulgence must perform an action to receive it. The most, this most often means saying specific prayers, but may also include the visiting of a particular place or the performance of a specific task. In other words, a work-based salvation. A work-based salvation. And so we know that scripture preaches and teaches something entirely different. I'm going to ask Susan to come back up and read the scriptures for the day, and then we will take this apart a little bit. Romans 3, 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. 
But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just, and the justifier of the one has faith in Jesus. Great. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we just explore some of the text that was just read, and as we talk about, Heavenly Father, a righteousness that can only come from the Lord Jesus Christ and to understand grace, I ask you, Heavenly Father, that as we gathered here this morning, that we glean from your word Thank you for the opportunity, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Just to let you know, there was a preamble to the 95 Thesis. It's a couple of short sentences, and the preamble to the 95 Thesis says this, out of love for the truth and from, and from desire, the Reverend, uh, Fa the Reverend Father Martin Luther, Master of Arts in Sacred Theology, an ordinary lecturer within, there in Wittenberg intends to defend the following statements and to dispute on them in this place. Therefore, he asks that those who cannot be present and dispute with him orally should do so in their absence by letter. So imagine this. This one man told the entire Roman Catholic Church and all of its leaderships, including the Pope, to show him in Scripture what they say is true. That's exactly what he did. And instead of defending what they thought they believed, they excommunicated him, and there also was talk that they tried to kill him. He was in hiding for a couple of years. The truth sh shall set you free. Don't care who you are. The truth shall set you free. So let's jump into the first two verses. Romans 3, verses 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says it to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world led account held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So believe it or not, following the Ten Commandments does not make you holy. It makes you aware of your sin. That's what the law does. Every human being is accountable to God for what he or she has done. Every human being is going to be held accountable for what he or she has done. Notice the words we know at the start of verse 19. Paul helps us to understand this truth. is obvious that every human being is being accountable to God. Now, we can have debate and discussions on the age of accountability. I've had those discussions. I've had those discussions in seminary. What is the age of accountability and, and all of that? Here's where I am on the age of accountability. I take it from the life of Jesus. You see, in Scripture, Jesus comes on the scene at his birth, and then two years later, he comes on the scene when the wise men went to see him. By the way, 
the world has it wrong. The wise men were not at the, the, the birth. The wise men showed up two years afterwards. Okay? That's just the truth. And then the next time we hear about Jesus, he is reasoning with the rabbis in the, in the temple at 13. Remember the scene? He was left behind. His parents with their whole entourage left the city. And a couple days later, they're like, where's Jesus? Well, wasn't he with you? Wasn't he with you? No, they went back. And there was Jesus in the temple. And what were the words of Jesus? You can look it up. He says, you should have known. This is, I'm saying in my, in my view. You should have known I was going to be in my father's house. That's what he said to his parents who were worried about where he was. So I believe, in my own personal belief, that the age of accountability was 13. That's what I believe. Everyone has an opportunity to believe what they want to believe. But I look at the life of Jesus, and at 13, he was reasoning with the rabbis and the teachers in the synagogue. And the next time we see Jesus, he starts his three-year ministry. In other words, we are all guilty in as filthy rags. That's what Isaiah chapter 64, 6 says. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. We are all sinners. No one escapes. Every human being in the world will stand face to face before God. Those without Jesus Christ will stand imperfect. Did I ever tell you my version of how we're going to stand before Christ? This is, this is Pastor Larry's version. I believe those of us that know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior... We're going to be standing before the throne of God, dripped in the blood of Jesus. That's what I believe. Because he shed his blood for us. Scripture also tells us in Revelation that your name is written in the Lamb's book of blood, the Lamb's book of life. I believe it's in the red blood of Jesus Christ. That's just what I believe. But I'm kind of graphic, as you can tell. But I believe I'm going to be standing there. And it's going to be obvious. I am all Jesus because I am dripping with his blood. If you are not a believer this morning, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please understand. I know it's tight and it's ripe what I'm getting ready to say. And I know what people say when they hear what I'm getting ready to say. Nothing else matters in life but your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because believe it or not, you're going to live longer in eternity than your years here on earth. We are. And you're either going to be in one of two places. You're either going to be in a Christless hell, going through agony day in and day out, that isn't me talking, it's what the Bible says. Or you're going to be living in righteousness. Remember the scene in Revelation as they sing around the throne? Holy, holy, holy. We're going to be singing that. And imagine millions and billions of people from every tribe, every nation, every nationality. And it doesn't matter if you can't sing like me. We're going to sound awesome. Absolutely awesome. And we're going to be in the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's another thing. The only thing in all of heaven that's going to have any scars at all is going to be Jesus Christ. Because we're getting new bodies. So the knees that are hurting right now as I stand before you, all gone. 
all the ailments that we all wake up with as we get older, something always happens. I think it's like that 40, 45 mark. All of a sudden you get up and you stretch, you go, oh, I got a, I got a muscle there. And then you move it to your 50s and then stuff starts breaking down. Don't care who you are. Why? Because these bodies are meant to break down. You know where it says that? It says that in Genesis. Every day your body's going to break down. I know we feel like we can do everything at 18. Why do you think when we had, when we have soldiers go to war, it's at 18? Because they're, they feel invincible. You're 25. I'm at my strongest. Our bodies are breaking down every day. Let's move on. Thesis number 32. Remember, there were 95 theses. Thesis number 32 says this. Those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be literally damned together with their teachers. So understand what he's saying here. They were being taught by the Roman Catholic Church that you have this indulgence letter when you die, that you'll be absolved from your sin. Huh? Think about that. Romans 10, verse 3 and 4 says this, Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. Did you hear that? They did not know the righteousness from God, so they sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Sin has invaded our whole being. Sin has invaded our whole, our whole being. I know you always hear we're born sinners. Yeah, we are. But it's invaded every part of who we are. Our body, mind, and soul. Paul lists various body parts to show how they no longer are used for God's glory. Did you know that? When I read this text, you're going to go, hmm, I never thought of it in that way. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. This is what Paul writes. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Here's what God's law declares. God's law declares this in, in, in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. Church, you will always notice that I will back up Scripture with Scripture. You see, the Word of God, the Old Testament, the New Testament, fits like a glove. They are codependent on each other. So it's very important if we're going to talk about what God loves, what God hates, what God's going to do, the future that we have in heaven must come from His Word. It must. Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is anyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. 
Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous we will live by because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is anyone who is hung on the tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, he took everything for us. Every sin, past and present and future. All of the law. All of it. He took it upon himself on the cross. And when he rose again, he overcame it all. That is why we praise the name of Jesus. Oh, hail the name of Jesus Christ. Don't you love these songs? He took it all. It's because of his righteousness. Thesis number 21. This is what thesis number 21 says. And I hope at some point you go online because Google is really cool. And you Google the 95 thesis. And you read it for yourself. Thus, those indulgence preachers are in error who say that a man is absolved from every penalty and saved by papal indulgence. Okay, I do not want to be disrespectful, but the Pope can't save you. Okay? Cannot. Martin Luther said it in 1517, and I'm saying it in 2022. The Pope can't save you. Man cannot be justified or made righteous by any good deed. So many of us get caught up in that trap. We get caught up in the trap that if I do good, God will erase the sin that I didn't confess to him. If I, if I write a check to this charity or that charity, I'm going to get double blessings because God knows those people need it. We all get caught up sometimes in that whole vicious cycle of trying to be, be uh, do-gooders. You know what really matters? When you do what's right because God led you to do what's right. And when God leads you to do what's right, here's what's missing. All the fanfare. All of the, did you see the check that I wrote? All of that is gone. Because it isn't your glory. It's God's glory. You're just being obedient. You're just being obedient. Do you see the difference? We do not believe in a works-based salvation. You didn't work for your salvation. It was by the grace of God that you have been saved. Galatians 3, verses 11 and 12 says this, Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. We live by faith. And I know that's difficult for a lot of people to understand because faith isn't tangible unless you're praying, unless your relationship with the Lord is growing and you have full faith that God knows what's good for you. I don't know what's good for me. Oh, I know what I like. I do. I know what I like. But God knows what's right for you. 
everything that we may like in life may not be right for us. Okay? Let me give you a really quick example. I love yellow cake with real live frosting. I don't mean that fake whipped cream frosting. Get out of here with that mess. I'm talking about that fattening frosting. When frosting was frosting. That's what I love. And if it wasn't for my mother, I would eat that every morning for breakfast. I'm not concerned about what's good for me. I'm concerned about what I like. Now, I know that's a wild example, but it hits the point. When we start living by faith, first off, the Lord knows your heart's desire. Because he created it and he put the desire in your heart. So he knows the desires of your heart. Our faith is what carries us to do the right thing. We're in his word. We're reading his word. We're understanding. When you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, and you ask him to come into your life, something holy happens. It is called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that literally takes up residence in your body. And the number one job of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your body is to interpret God's word. Many of us, when we became Christians, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Bible was no longer a history book. A transformation happens where now the Bible is God's word. And all of a sudden, you see things differently. You see things different. Let me give you another. Let me give you a true life example. When I became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ at 28, I used to work for a company, very popular company. I'm not going to say it because we're online. But I was a salesman. And we had the number one, two, seven and 12 products on the market. And every Friday we had what was called admin time back in the day. Back in the day, talking about the 80s. We were one of the first companies to have a laptop computer before it was a thing. I had a laptop computer with a stand that would fit on my steering wheel we plugged it into the lighter, and I was able to do work and transmit my sales back to the company or what I got accomplished that day. And every Friday is what we call our admin day. And that was the day that you reconciled all of your receipts, all of your traveling, all the sales you did, and you did everything. And here's what this company did. They don't do it anymore, I'm sure. But what the company did was at the beginning of the month, they mailed you four blank checks signed. And every Friday, you wrote a check to yourself for the expenses. There was no accountability. So before I became a Christian, I'm writing checks because I'm going, well, I got a golf on Saturday. Greens fees or whatever, so I'll just say that I drove these 3,000 miles or whatever. Then I became a Christian. And that first Friday, that first admin Friday, I'm sitting in my car, and I'm doing my expenses, and then it hit me. I gotta tell the truth. I gotta tell the truth. So I told the truth. This is no, exa no exaggeration. For four weeks, I told the truth. On the fifth week, my boss, who's a boss, her office is out of New York, she flew in and she said, 
I don't believe you're working. Because the last four weeks, I was doing the same job. But I had been filling my expense reports with what I wanted and what I needed. And there was a vast difference in the checks I was writing as a Christian man and the checks I was writing when I was in the world. And she asked me what the difference was. And I told her. You know what she said to me? Larry, everybody does that. I didn't get fired. Everybody does that. We know that. And I said, this guy's not doing it anymore. True story. When we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, life changes for you. When you are reading God's word, for some of us, the change is immediate in some areas and slower in others. But when you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, life changes. You see things differently because you desire to walk holy. You desire to walk in righteousness because you're starting to understand the grace that the Lord Jesus Christ has given you. The purpose of the law is not to justify. No. Not to make righteous, but to point out sin. To tell man he is a sinner. The law was given to make man aware of sin. Why, you ask? So that man would know he is sinful and he needs to see God for forgiveness and salvation. If we didn't know that we were sinful, what need for Christ would we have? There wouldn't be any need. So what does the Bible say about this matter? Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man. Get that? Don't miss that. God sent his Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. Do you understand how important the Holy Spirit dwelling in your life actually is? It's huge. It's everything. Let's move on. The last one before you're walking away thought. Thesis number one says, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, and he's drawing this from Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. That's where he's getting, that's where, he, that's where this thought came from. He, he says he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. So Martin Luther learned that we need to repent, and that repenting was a personal thing through the Holy Spirit to a holy Jesus Christ. We repent of our sins. There is no man alive that I can repent to. If I've wronged someone, I can walk to that person and apologize, yes. Ask for their forgiveness, yes. Because you're being upfront. But that person, that person can't save me. Only Jesus Christ can. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 says this, from the, time on Je from the time on Jesus began to preach, when he began to preach, repent, 
For the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus preached, repent. Repent. Here's your walking away thought. Luther began to rediscover the central message of the Bible, that God loves his people, God forgives his people, that God gives us poor, miserable sinners his righteousness as our hope and security. Did you get that? God gives us his righteousness because he died on the cross for our hope and security. Having a head knowledge, now, now, now I'm going to talk to you. Having a head knowledge of this fact will not get you to heaven. Having a head knowledge that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins will not get you to heaven. You work your neighbors, you go to school if you're a student, either in high school, middle school, college, grad school. You are working around people who know about Jesus, but don't know Jesus. They know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. Do you want an example of that? When you watch the news tonight, and something tragic happens in the neighborhood. And they talk to the next door neighbor. They've lived there for years. And nothing happened. Well, did you know them? You know, we just say hi. And I sit there and I say, well, you didn't know your neighbors. Why are you commenting? Well, that's what a lot of people do with Jesus. Well, I know they say that he died on the cross. I don't believe that, but I know they say that. I know that they say he was 33 when he died. Yeah, yeah. They know the facts of Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. And you can only know Jesus through the Holy Spirit. This knowledge must travel from the heart, from the head. The knowledge must travel to the heart for the Holy Spirit to take up residence and start the process of, a, of Christ-likeness. And do you know what Christ-likeness does for Christians? Do you know what it does? It brings joy. Christ-likeness brings joy. Now, I know all of us don't live in a joyful life. We don't like it when someone passes. We don't like it when we're being, having challenges in our life. We don't like it when we got to face an operation. Those are facts of life. The joy is knowing that God got your back. That Jesus Christ is with you. Pastor Dennis just had so shoulder surgery. I went to see him the night that he got out of surgery and he went into his room, and I went to see him. Now, I will tell you, when I talked to Elaine earlier, and I said, if you need anything, sister, you call. Now, how many of you guys know Pastor Dennis? Okay, so when I went to see Pastor Dennis, you know what I bought him? A cup of coffee. And a sandwich from Dunkin' Donuts. Now, when I talked to Elaine, and she said his coffee, because, well, I know, I said to Elaine, I said, I know that, you know, Pastor Dennis likes his coffee light. Now, you gotta, uh, many of you don't know, but Pastor Dennis was my mentor. I was his associate pastor for 10 years while he was the senior pastor. I know he likes his coffee light. But here's what girlfriend said to me. She said, now, Larry... You ask for 12 shots of cream. I said, what? I said, so he likes warm cream. He doesn't really like coffee all these years. And she says, well, you have to tell them 12 creams. I said, are you serious? And she started laughing. Yes, Larry, I'm serious. I said, no problem, sister, I got gotcha. you. And when I got the coffee in, in his sandwich, here's something that was really wild. 
It was never warm. They handed me the coffee. You know how you get a cup of hot coffee? You can feel the heat? Because they don't use styrofoam anymore. So you can feel I was like, dude, this is like lukewarm. And I went to see him and brought him his coffee. And he did say hi, Larry, as he was reaching for the coffee. <laughs> he only had one wing, and he had to do it with his left hand because his right shoulder was in a sling and all this stuff. But you should have saw him. He is sitting up in bed, and I said, hey, Pastor, how you doing? Hi, Larry. <laughs> so you know Pastor Dennis. Pray for them. Elaine is sick right now. Pray for her as well. Keep them in your prayers. But let's finish up. This knowledge must travel to the heart for the Holy Spirit to take up residence and start the process of Christ-likeness, which leads to joy. There are five, five solo, sol solus, solus that came out of the Reformation. Five. Here are the five solas, I, and I have to end with this, because it wouldn't be Reformation Sunday unless you understood this. Sola, gra sola grata, gra sola gratia means grace alone. Solo gratia means grace alone. Solo fida means faith alone. Sola Christa means Christ alone. Sola Scriptura means scripture alone. Sola di Gloria, Gloria, to the glory of God alone. This is what the Reformation is. And I pray that if you walked in this morning and you had some knowledge of the Reformation or no knowledge, that you now understand just how important the Reformation was because that started everything as to what we call Christianity today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here this morning. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for those saints who went before us, who paved the way, Heavenly Father, for our understanding. I pray, Heavenly Father, there's any hearers or people present who don't know you as their Lord and Savior, that this morning they got a clear understanding of salvation through grace in Jesus Christ. So I ask you, Lord God, as I prayed earlier today, that none of us leave here the same because we heard from you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up. Let's let's.